when I say a feminist social media or a feminist internet, what would that be for you? And you know, her uh, her description was well, it would be anti patriarchy, anti colonialism, and anti capitalism. And I think that's just such a good way to put it. the GDF Think Tank. Today we're discussing queering online spaces and on the panel today we have Tanvi Kanchan, a queer and feminist media researcher, Tiffany Mugo, the founder and curator of Hola Africa, Nu, the founder of Revival Disability Magazine, and Eliza Bacon, our researcher from Global Digital Futures. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to just start with uh, maybe you can give brief descriptions about your platforms, or organizations, or your work. And um, yeah, what are you doing on your platforms? And why did you feel that you needed to launch these platforms? Maybe, um, Tiffany, we could start with you on Hola Africa. I always feel like I go first in these things, but it's fine because it means I can mess it up real quick before anyone comes in. Um, so hi, I run Hola Africa, which is like an online sex positive platform that deals with all things sex and sexuality we're the sort of platform that stays getting banned from Facebook because of our freaky Fridays and the TikToks that we post and all the things that we do like we are that platform um and it initially started as a sort of blog right where people like you know lesbians because you know I was young and not woke back then um lesbians from around the continent could just like submit their pieces and any nonsense they wanted to submit because we wanted a space where there was a different narrative outside of what was you know, expected around, especially lesbian black bodies, where it was always the violence and what was called corrective rape at the time, but now is termed homophobic rape. And we were like, but what about like the everyday? What about like, you know, you're having trouble with your girlfriend or you can't get a date or you can't get someone to sit on your face on a Saturday night. Like, these are the questions that we really wanted to answer. And over time, you know, with the growth of different social media platforms, um, we started playing around in different spaces, doing different things. And at this moment in time, one of our most active platforms is actually Instagram, where we have like, we just always posting all the things all the time. Um, you know, we've got a couple of books out, which is really exciting. Um, one of my personal, I know you're not supposed to have favorites with your kids, but um, my personal favorite of the books that we have out is Touch, which is like this anthology of sex, sexuality, and sensuality. And basically it's what or Holla originally was, but now in book form. Um, and it's all very grown. And then we also have the Basically Life podcast, which is just fun. It's basically where I sit and drink wine with queers from around the continent and the world. And I'm like, so why is dating during a pandemic hard? And they're like, because people are trash. And I'm like, that makes sense. Very fair. So basically that is the work that I do and what Holla is in a nutshell. Nice. And yeah, we'll go into it a little bit more. You've got a lot of things going on online and offline. It's really, really cool. Um, so maybe Tanvi, you can tell us, uh, yeah, your research focus and other things that you've been working on as well in this space. Sure, yeah. So uh, thanks so much, Shifo, for having me on this panel. And first off, I just want to say it's really quite an honor and a privilege to be here with Tiffany. Um, I followed Hola Africa's work for many years. Um, you know, I also like have cited you in some of the work that I've done in my masters. So it's really, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's really it's really great to share space with you um, in this panel and just listen to you speak and and hear from you as well. And um, you know, I myself, of course, don't particularly work with a particular platform, uh, but I'm very interested in these spaces. A lot of my research is also on kind of um, specifically, I suppose, Indian queer digital spaces. Um, and also looking at what it means to kind of decolonize queer identity, especially from an Indian context. Um, and I think spaces like Hall Africa, like Revival Disability Magazine, like a lot of other spaces online are so important, the specific kind of global South. I mean, we can problematize that term, but like the global South kind of 
spaces that are there that really kind of decenter the idea of the um you know white western queer and kind of move to well let's really explore what it means to be queer in other contexts in the global south um especially i think whole africa tiffany like you were mentioning does such a great job of just really championing like black bodies just championing bodies of people of color of like <laughs> queer people of color specifically um and I, especially when i'll be like going through my instagram on fridays and then the freaky friday post comes up and i'm like oh i hope no one's looking at my feed <laughs> but i'm just going to look at it real quick and like swipe through um and it's yeah it's it's always one of those like kind of guilty pleasures um you know when i like look through it but uh yeah i think such spaces are so important and it's so it's really great to hear from people like tiffany and nu about the work that they're doing um and these kinds of spaces and yeah i think it's it's like i said i think it's particularly important to kind of decenter that white western queer or in for that matter also in other contexts um decenter the most privileged presentation of queerness i suppose and that differs of course from context to context and and country to country uh but i think that's just such an important part of it as well because just because spaces are focusing on queer like digital spaces are focusing on queer experiences it doesn't mean that they're not reifying kind of offline structures of power as well uh be that things of class of race of caste when it comes to india or south asia um you know so i think it's it's really important to really focus on these spaces and really i mean encourage these spaces to grow i think so yeah amazing thank you tanvi and yeah new why didn't you tell us also about yeah. your, your platform and what you felt the need was in creating the platform yeah so basically revival is like it's a disable uh, it's a uh, an affirmative desi community of disabled and queer folks in india plus uh, it also a magazine focusing on narratives of disability uh, queerness and intersectional feminism so um, after listening to tiffany and tanmi uh, i really resonate with the fact of um, you know creating a space um, where we are kind of um, dissenting against the um, against the mainstream narrative of our identities such as the mainstream identity of disability in india is that uh, we are um, infantilized and we are just uh, we just exist for uh, inspiration for you know and uh, making non disabled folks motivated to live their lives to be grateful about their lives um i wanted to create a space where we acknowledge the same body in our heart right where we dress up and um uh and like putting on lipstick for me is an act of political rebellion uh, nearly because um as the same women we are told that we are denied um basic aspects of femininity not only femininity beyond the binary um to queerness to bisexuality i identify as someone who's um physically disabled and bisexual and um many times i've been told that um your bisexuality is invalid because you haven't um done something with anyone like you have to prove your sexuality so i was just like fuck all of this i i really need to create a space of my own because um growing up disabled and queer i i had never um uh, i never felt like i truly belonged um in any of the institution i went to um i am always faced a lot of alienation and a lot of subtle bullying um you know um like whenever i used to ask for help they would be like i'm asking for a favor and became like that dynamic that toxic dynamic so i really needed to create a space that was away from all of that um that was for me and my community um so you know in in revival uh, we believe in interdependence and um and just like identity comes first 
we and the most important thing is that we believe each other right um if someone says they have a disability even if it's invisible yes they have a disability there is no second guessing there is no um gaslighting because we already face that from our uh, environment right so yeah amazing thank you so much of such a personal account as well um and you know you mentioned the notion of belonging and interdependence um which leads me to my next question around like the possibilities you find all of you um in um exploring and creating and supporting different identities online. Um, maybe <laughs> we'll go in around, maybe Tiffany, you could go first in terms of, yeah, what are the possibilities online? So, you know, just the fact that I have met two people from two very different contexts on this panel alone. I think one of the things that really helped with Hala was the ability to just create a different space for community, right? So it stopped being about, um, you know, where you were physically based, right, where you were geographically based. And it became about like, okay, what are our shared things across the board? Because as everyone knows, you know, nationalism and tribalism and all those things are a mess, right? So the fact is that like the fact that I could put this platform online and find community in so many different places and like everything from like going to conferences. So even if you the platform is online, the fact that you can go and find people in physical spaces. And for us, it's managed, it's like allowed us to do work in so many like different countries. Cause now you find somebody and you find them online and you're like, okay, cool. We're going to go to Botswana and do something. We, we went to Nigeria, you know, in a pre pandemic world, God bless. Um, we went to Nigeria and we had workshops there, but it would never have been something that we would have been able to do like to find those partners and to find those people and to figure out that there are those connections, right? Because everyone's like, it's, and I guess it's kind of easier for me because everyone's struggling with sex. Guys, no one knows anything about sex. It's a dumpster fire. It is keeping me in rent. Like I am shook. I am really shook. No one knows anything. I don't know anything. I don't know why people are paying me to speak about these things, but it's fine. And so just like figuring out the different ways like, you know, say we're struggling with things or we're engaging with things or we're experiencing things, but even also engaging in the differences. I think that's also been the really interesting thing about like this sort of little digital community that Holla has like, you know, created or whatever. There's just so many differences and it also bonds people. It's just, it's so nice. It never would have happened without the digital space, basically. Yeah, that's so amazing. And just as a sort of addition to the question, I also want to ask, is there a difference in self-expression online versus on offline? Oh, I, on my part, I would say yes. Like people are, so, <laughs> so to give the example, right? I'm not a very flirtatious person offline, um, but I'm going through a phase right now where all I'm doing is thirst trapping online. Like I wear no clothes on the online space but like as you can see when I'm in my real world I've got a hoodie on night because I pole dance as well so nine times out of ten I'm like in my pole dancing like shorts and sneakers in a hoodie looking like really kind of just you know sketch type thing but like you should see me online it's a mess right like got the shorts on I'm upside down I'm on the pole I'm doing things I'm trying to thirst trap because non-monogamy is a full-time job guys non-monogamy is a full-time job so I think there is that sometimes that freedom because you can also curate yourself a lot more. Whereas if you walk into a room, how people perceive you is very, like it's, there's a lot of it that's out of your control, but with the online space, have I put a filter? I don't do filters, but like, have I put a filter? What is my caption saying? Is it a reel or is it like an actual post? Is it on Instagram? Is it on TikTok? Like there's a way to curate yourself that both, is limiting but also gives a freedom so sometimes you get people expressing themselves a lot more that's that's been my experience because thirst trapping is a real thing <laughs> thank you so much tiffany and yeah I, I i do want to get into that as well this question of 
the possibilities and then maybe also the limits of self-expression online but we'll just put a pin in that um Mu, maybe you could tell us also about the possibilities you find online as well as the possibilities for self-expression yeah okay so um uh inner revival started during the pandemic um in um april of 2020 um it was also like after a really bad breakup um a breakup when i was like stifled and i feel like all my life i've um been forced to through um i don't know whether it's media or whether it's friends i've i've been forced to like follow um compulsive heteronormativity so um it was a relationship where i was really stifled and um uh, emotionally neglected um so after that i was just like okay um i've felt like this my entire life right i felt trapped and um i don't I haven't liked my body, my queer body, my entire life, or I haven't explored my sexuality. So why is that? So um, when I created Revival, the name Revival is also a revival of my um, new self, my new disabled self, um, of taking, um, of feeling power in my disability, right? Um, of the new no, in, in a way. Um, so it was online because it was still there's a pandemic. So, um, so, you know, as disabled folks, uh, disabled and queer folks, we create our own community, um, our own chosen family, um, our own ways of how we want to interact with the world. Uh, I feel like the, the revival community, um, so as a testimony for disabled joy and community, as I mentioned, a community of interdependence and self-fulfillment and uh, speaking without without any um um speaking uh without any you know um what's the word? Uh without any like just talking, you know, genuine conversation, active dialogue of what it really means to be Indian and disabled and queer, or what it really means to um, live with an abusive family, um, or what it means to not, to not be able to get access to mental health, um, or there's a lot of access jealousy, um, honestly, that, that I face as a physically disabled queer woman, where um, I'm just, now that I'm home, there's this idea of me just uh, being in my room, um, right, working, um, not like going out and having fun. You know, this, this idea that pe people have of disabled women in, in general, um, we are expected to be obedient and studious and and not have fun, not even laugh, right? Laughing as a form of res resistance. Um, every movement, every every step in a public space as a form of resistance. And uh, lately, I've also been thinking about this a lot since a lot of my life feels stagnant right now. That one is, yes, I really um, agree with Tiffany, how hard it is to date during a pandemic because dating apps are trash. Um, men on dating apps are trash. Uh, when they find out you're bisexual, they um, they want to have a threesome and without like unsolicited comments, right? Um, well, there's, I want to talk about a lot of loneliness and longing. And, and how we kind of navigate that, right? How we create community through an online space. Um, uh, so there's something about saying, for example, our community is on, is on WhatsApp and on other platforms, Discord, um, Instagram. 
so there's a lot of um creating communities online and you know coming out new uh digital worlds through our chats so there's something about saying oh my wheelchair does that thing too or i tie a ribbon around my crutch too um as a sign of relatability or uh, my ex my ex was able to too and he said this too like there's a lot of relatability in love and and relationships and disability uh because all of our exes have been trash and ableist um and the thing about uh disabled folks depending on each other is that there's a lot of power and solidarity um uh, in such moments the tiny little joys uh and shelter that we get by meeting people more like us right those who have similar quirks those who dance and move in a disabled way too those who have curled disabled fingers like us too and find beauty in it right um there's something about seeing curved fingers the same as you or learning how to take power in a disabled walk because each time a disabled adult um walks confidently into a room taking up space i feel like if there's a disabled child in that room uh, they would feel really happy and being represented and you know they would feel like there's nothing wrong with walking with a crutch or being on a wheelchair and um we pay attention to movement a lot uh, why is it that we walk into a revolution why can't it be that we um walk wheel hop or limp into a revolution right what does walking into a revolution look like for you um in a world where in in india specifically and also the world where working for the disabled is seen as charity work we are creating our own representation we're choosing how we want to appear to the world we're choosing not to pander to non disabled folks we're choosing to collectively engage in disabled dissent when choosing to openly express our anger against ableism and being unacknowledged so while we celebrate our disabilities it's also very important to uh, leave space for grieving for collective longing for expressing anger um uh, for being angry at our disabled bodies um it's okay not to love your body 24/7 that's not self love um it's okay to express anger at chronic pain or the fact that our bodies don't function uh, always function how we want them to so concluding i just feel that um digital advocacy and creating online communities has really made um i'm really made in access to for me as for my community because most of us are like we are chronically ill and immunocompromised so you know we can't um go out that often and and uh, and agitate and organize so i feel like online communities are really like um a gift of accessibility yeah wow like you just touched on so many things like you know creating new worlds um creating spaces that are accessible when you know offline real world spaces are inaccessible uh <laughs> celebrating and creating moments of joy as well which i think both of your platforms do particularly well it's like the joy of you know your communities or um self expression as well um yeah thank you so much new and uh yeah tanvi i'd also maybe pose the question to you maybe putting it in the context of yeah what this means in media or greater oh sure, no absolutely um and yeah i i just kind of wanted to i think tiffany tiffany and new both put it really well in terms of just kind of coming at it from their own context and perspectives on why queer digital spaces are so important um specifically when you're kind of looking at certain marginalized identities even within 
kind of queer spaces. Um, and I just kind of really wanted to echo what both of them contributed as well. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Tiffany also mentioned that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one of the situations where like no one knows about sex. And I think that's something that I had like the opportunity to listen to Paramita's podcast episode as well. And I think that's something that she mentions as well. It's like, you know, no one, no one knows what's happening. And, and the idea is to kind of just put your fingers into those pies and be like, okay, let's, let's kind of, you know, uh, figure this out. And I think that's such an important uh, and overlooked part especially in say the Indian or the South Asian context where even talking about cishet sexuality is difficult, right? It's, 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 it's like a no, no. So when you're talking about queer sexuality, it's like a, a double, triple layer of, of no, no. So when we already have so much taboo around just openly discussing sexuality, I think that's why queer spaces specifically and really like um, open unabashed queer spaces are so important. Uh, for me, I think it's always interesting, you know, uh, I think Tiffany and Nu both touched upon really the possibilities and po potentials of online spaces, uh, particularly, say, social media platforms in creating, um, you know, possibilities for queer expression. I think I'm always very interested in kind of that tension between visibility and invisibility for marginalized folks, because I think there's always that tension where visibility comes both with a lot of pros, but also a lot of cons because it means that you're able to kind of represent yourself, you're able to um, speak up for yourself and define who you are and what your community is. But that also means very often you're opening yourself up to more attention and therefore more abuse, which is unfortunately a very naturalized part of social media spaces, particularly. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, that, that tension always exists. I think uh, it's always a very difficult line to walk where you realize that well i want to be more visible but this means that the trolls are probably going to flock to me and they're probably going to tell me all of the ways in which i'm wrong and all of the ways why i shouldn't exist and you know i shouldn't be like on this platform um and i think that's it's always like a difficult uh consideration for marginalized folks because you have to kind of un unfortunately resign yourself to the fact that you're going to attract this kind of attention of course that does I suppose bring us to some questions of just platform moderation and the ways in which social media platforms function. Um, and I know that's, that's something like Parumita spoke about as well. And I think she, she talks about not synonymizing the internet and social media, which I think is very important because you know platforms like say Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, like the big mainstream ones that we have right now, they all operate on logics of pro profit and all of them operate on these kind of logics of virality, but also their kind of algorithmic disciplining of what you're seeing, what kind of content is moderated, what isn't, also which content, um, you know, uh, crosses their community standards. And it comes back to the idea of like the fact that say a, a, a topless skinny white woman is less likely to have her post flagged and taken down as opposed to say uh, a fat queer, you know, person of color who kind of puts up a photo of themselves without their, their t-shirt, for example. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of, of course, a lot of racist logics is there as well about what gets moderated in which ways. Um, but I think because of that, what I'm very interested in is kind of, you know, how can we move away from that capitalist idea of what the internet is um, and, you know, I had the opportunity with my work for IT for Change to uh, interview Naomi Fontanos, who's um, the executive director of Ganda Filipinas. She's a trans activist um, in uh, the Philippines. And, you know, she, I asked her the question of what would, when I say a feminist social media or a feminist internet, what would that be for you? And, you know, her, uh, her description was, well, it would be anti-patriarchy anti-colonialism and anti-capitalism. And I think that's just such a good way to put it together. I think that's so important, especially when we talk about queering digital spaces, because I think about the idea of queering also not just in the idea of queer as LGBT you know, identity, but queering as in change, as in kind of skewing the perspective, right? So queering digital space also means to then go beyond the mainstream of what the kind of Silicon Valley platforms have to offer. Um, and, you know, one of the things I was thinking about when I was kind of thinking about this panel today was um, Tumblr as a platform and the fact that it was one of the places, I mean, you know, that me as like a 12, 13 year old kind of going on to 
Tumblr being one of the first places where I was exposed to any kind of feminist thought or queer thought because that was that was the way in which I had any access to these kinds of discussions. And the fact that, you know, a decade plus later, I still return to that platform. And it's really funny, like in my head, I think of it as like the example of a very failed capitalist platform because Tumblr has failed to make any kind of, I mean, from an outsider perspective, it seems that they've failed to make any kind of money from their platform at all. Um, they've tried to monetize over and over again. <laughs> it's just completely failed, which is to the benefit of that platform because it means that, I mean, you know, I could be wrong, but from just looking at it, the majority of the user base seems to be queer people. And it's kind of, it's, that's my space. When I think about my space, I think about, you know, Tumblr, that's, that's where I love to go. And it's essentially because they've really failed to monetize or build like an ad revenue system for their platform, which means that no one can make money off of Tumblr the way that someone can make money off of Instagram. And that also means that the dynamics of how people post and engage on in, in a space like that is very different. Um, and it also kind of opens itself up for more, um, for a queer space in that sense, right? So, I mean, I think of spaces like that and moving beyond social media, I think of spaces of, I suppose they kind of hark back to the old days of the internet where we had things like live journal. And, you know, I also think of like archive of our own and fanfiction.net, all of like the fandom spaces where people would be writing kind of queer fanfic. And that's also, I mean, that's that's a very big part of the queer internet, right? Like that's that's those fandom spaces. Of course, there are a lot of um, problems there where again, they seem to be very dominated by kind of the white Western voices, white Western queers. Um, and there are, like I said, I think it just kind of, some things get reified online as they do offline. Um, but, you know, these are the spaces that I think of when I think of really the possibilities of, uh, the queer internet, you know, and I, I really am very interested to see if there is ways that we can imagine queer digital spaces that go beyond social media, that kind of go back to this idea of like the old days of the internet where you had like things like blogs and, you know, these kind of forums and chat spaces and things like that, uh, where you can kind of really build that community and really engage with other folks um, who you can find kind of resonance and solidarity with. But yeah, no, those are just uh, a few of my thoughts on on this question, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, yeah, I agree with you on so many points um, because yeah, queer is the notion of distorting, disrupting, it's messiness, isn't it? And Paramita in um, Vovra in our uh, podcast interview, she was talking about this a lot, you know, about the generations of the internet from that messy blogosphere to, this more slick and curated social media dominant, dominated space. So actually, um, Tiffany and Nu, I wanted to ask if, do you, is, is, is the focus of your platforms or your work perhaps um, social media or are you using other online spaces or are you using, you, you, you mentioned you've got some offline projects as well. How do you sort of integrate different spaces or different approaches within your projects? Um, Tiffany, maybe you can start. Um, so, you know, anyone who's ever interacted with Holland knows that there's a brand. <laughs> um, so basically like the focus is on sex and pleasure and sexuality. So, and it's a, it's a lot about curating spaces. So that, that is like always been our main focus, like the act of curation and the act of people building the space themselves. Um, so one of the things, so we do have social media. We used to have a website and then guys, websites are hard and then it crashed and I just, ugh, I'm lazy. It's fine. I'll figure it out sometime. Um, but then a lot of our focus begun to be in sort of like creating sort of anthologies because storytelling has also been a huge, huge part of like the work that we do. So, um, we've had like a couple of books out. So we had Excel, which was sort of like a collection of queer erotica, we had Dark Juices, which was doing the rounds at some point, which was free for download. That was fun. Um, and it was just like a whole bunch of just like erotica. So we went through a very erotica phase. Um, I personally wrote a book called Quirky Quick Guide to Having Great Sex, which that was also like kind of fun. And then I also brought in some people with that. And then our latest offering now is Touch, like the way I said. And so it's just been that case of taking the sort of sex and sexuality and pleasure brand and our methodology, which is like curation and creating space. Because one of the things with Holla, which is what makes panels like this very awkward for me, is that we kind of don't want anyone to know 
who's behind Holla because Holla is, I know it's going to sound so cheesy. I should put it on a Hallmark card, but like Holla is all of y'all ah, type thing. Um, and it's about like, you know, people being in the space and why like, even though we create material internally, you will, you'll always find that like, say our social media manual was written by like a member of our community and um, the graphics were provided by another member of our community. So it's just that, that sort of push to continuously have people feeding into the space and it not being about us because what can sometimes happen with these spaces, um, especially online spaces, is that cult of personality where it becomes about the, the founder. And so next thing you know, I'm doing all sorts of like nonsense beep on Holla because I'm like, this is my brand and I'm doing a thing. And for me, I found that over the years, it helps a lot with accountability because if people don't want that on the platform, then they'll say, and rather than me being like, I know what y'all want, right? So to give an example, there was a time when we started like a campaign and it ended up running for like a year and a half called Queering the Cloak. Um, because of just sort of like the sexual violence within the queer community. And it actually came about because we reposted an abuser and somebody was like, I don't think I can follow my favorite platform anymore because this is what's happened. And so rather than like clapping back and being like, we didn't know, how are we supposed to know? We were like, okay, cool. It's time to pivot. We've harmed our community. We need to add to this conversation. What can we do? So like, I think for me, having that sort of curation methodology has really helped with like accountability and you know also because I never really know what's going on so it's really helpful to like get input <laughs> from like what's going on and like the input comes in the form of like people actually adding to the space be it like reposting TikToks or submitting a piece for an anthology like it's it's all a thing good times <laughs> oh that's amazing and I think that aspect of like co-creation as well is something that's so important. I don't know, whenever we're considering tech in the global south, we're looking at the global south and when we're considering like just different solutions or research, or whatever, that's sort of applied to the global south, you're like, actually, this should be a space of co-creation, you know, where you're actually responding to what's being said in the context or what's relevant to the context like what you're talking about and I mean your platform is across Africa so maybe like a Kenyan in South Africa doesn't have the full say over like do you know what I mean it's just so much it's truly inclusive you know so that's really really it's cool. so nice I feel like so much of what everyone's talking about it always just comes back to this word of like being generative rather than anything else and that was something that Chippo and I have talked a lot about since talking to Paramita which was one of the best conversations of my life <laughs> um, and <laughs> we were just talking about that so much and it's just like I know I found talking to Paramita such a good reminder for that in myself that coming back to being generative is like always the best always the best thing to do and and in terms of these online spaces and I guess that's like querying as well because querying is like disrupting and like stretching and expanding our, our all of our ideas about the world and actually that is a, a it can be combative too but it's it's generative um at its core it's just yeah so great to hear no, that's awesome thanks eliza and um new maybe you could also tell us about yeah like other than social media what other spaces are you using online or offline uh so before i begin with my answer i would just like to uh, reiterate what Tanvi was saying and like continue with that um this just i just remember this point that um there's also a lot of joy you know in in queer sex in being um being in exploring your sexuality in being sexual um just as like there's nothing really um just as like the male gaze has ruined um uh you know breasts boobs uh, by making it overtly sexual while while it's just like yellow yellow sacks of fat um similarly there's just a certain joy in you know um sexting your partner um it doesn't have to be sexual it can just be like um lying naked and laughing your ass is off or something like that or like um having a partner accept your disabled body 
right? It's not always um, the way they portray on media or um, how the um, the end point has to be um, has to be a certain idea that is very colonized and and um, just as Tanvi and Tiffany said, uh, very white, very non-disabled. Um, also, I don't know why I use non-disabled. I would like to use able-bodied, but yeah. Yeah, they say that non-disabled is more politically correct, but honestly, I would like to use able-bodied. Um, yeah, so that. And um, secondly, I also feel not related to this, I feel that my project is also a product of collective labor, a product of um, care and, and, and love, and you know, a lot of a lot of disabled joy and dissent. Um uh, obviously, like I've just it's just been one year, and I feel that right now I'm just like having fun with my project, you know, like taking in different places, um, getting everybody's inputs, um, as ev everyone, each individual joins the project, they mold it in their own way, right? Um, so for now, it's just like, I'm still a student. So it's just like having fun, realizing myself as the days go by and becoming more of myself with the help of my project. Um, so we do have campaigns. Um, one of our campaigns uh, is um, Unhide the Disability, uh, which is also a tagline um, because um, I, uh, I, um, all of us came up with this campaign because we've been hiding our disabilities our entire life, um, whether it's hiding our mobility aids, uh, when there's a picture being taken, or, or it's like um, not wanting to wear dresses with our leg braces because somehow uh, we have this internalized idea of um, being less feminine if we wear dresses with our leg braces. But now we're just like, fuck it, right? <laughs> this is me, this is my disabled body and I'm here to stay. So um, then we have a campaign um, with uh, Blank Noise, which is an organization that that basically they work towards the uh, towards the right of being defenseless in public spaces, um, where women meet. Uh, when I say women, I also mean non-binary and trans folk um, and queer folk. Uh, we all meet in public spaces. We meet to sleep, right? To rest. To to uh, to just to just exist in public spaces because there's this there's this thing uh, there's this reality that that when you see men in public spaces they are relaxed they are defenseless they are not on their guard they are just existing right having fun they are wandering aimlessly they are loitering uh, another movement called why loiter no. so. Why can't we be the same way, right? So this is about creating spaces, reimagining feminist disabled futures. Um, we have uh, a campaign called Disabled Women Riot, um, which is also um, dealing with um, trigger warning. I'm going to talk about abuse. Um, so it deals with uh, um, sexual abuse, or domestic abuse of disabled women. Um, as someone who's been a survivor of, of um, sexual and emotional abuse, um, this, uh, this campaign started as an anonymous um, Twitter account, right? Again, using uh, digital spaces as a medium to navigate, to, uh, to like, um, communicate what we want to say. Um, it started the, as an anonymous account by me, where it was open to the community. It still is open to the community. Um, all of us talk about our abuse. Um, if we are 
comfortable we 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 name our abusers if we are not we keep it anonymous but nobody really knows like um who owns this account and and like where it's from so then the anonymity is maintained um many a times we are then there's this certain fear you know of of logistics and disabled women um how do you um how do you escape a violent situation when you're physically disabled um how do you uh, how do you um why is it that you have to scream and say no right um what happens when you have a speech disability or you're deaf right uh, like what happens then and just because you didn't say no doesn't mean you said yes right so this entire narrative of um of being disabled and being sexual and being sexual freely right um uh, unfortunately there's, there's a lot of violence inflicted with it right when we are when uh, we might be empowered and we might love our bodies and want to go out there and, and like hook up with strangers but i feel like as a physically disabled woman even this pulls me back the fear pulls me back but at the same time it's contrasting because all these movements are working to mitigate that fear to eliminate that fear right to be as we are um yeah thank you so much nu and yeah i mean it just made me think so much about the importance i think representation is a word that maybe now can lose its urgency just because of how it's bandied so much but it's the crux of you know also what you're talking about like being seen in certain spaces like demanding to take space and have your true narrative and be considered in ways that you know other people would take for granted which is why this you know representation is so important um so thank you so much and tanvi yeah i just want to sort of get your views on it as well sure yeah um no i i just absolutely really think you know when we since you brought up the idea of representation i think yeah i think it's 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 a word that's been used so much that it's kind of become co-opted into these kind of capitalist ideas of well you're represented because we have this person who ticks this box as a character in this film and you know things like that and i think the idea of moving from representation to like radical kind of inclusion is so much more important and is perhaps so much more useful because it's not really about representation but it's about like meaningful inclusion right um and i think yeah i, I think online spaces afford like going back to that that idea and the question that you posed originally about you know the online and the offline and and the the, the tension i suppose between the two and then using both I think online spaces are so important for queer communities particularly in contexts um and in places where you may not have very visible queer communities in the physical space because maybe you lack um areas or spaces or or you know things like gay bars for example which might be in in other contexts or one of the places where you can of course not only meet other queers whether that's for you know purposes of like romantic sexual reasons but also like things like meeting queer elders right and like just talking to people who come before you people who've lived entire lives as queer people like as you know as a as as say an out and proud butch lesbian right and then you're like well this is great for me to actually see someone who's like say in their 40s or their 50s as someone who's in their 20s to be like this is i mean that is quote and quote representation right that's that's understanding um and and seeing and being these the lives of, of other queer elders being made visible um and very often in, in certain contexts that's not a reality because that's just because of colonial legacies or otherwise because of you know kind of the politics um of that context that's not necessarily a very accessible space uh, offline and i think that's why online spaces become all the more important because it can be very alienating and very isolating otherwise because you kind of end up believing that you're the only person who exists who's like you <laughs> in your city or in your country and that's really just one of the most alienating feelings i think as a queer person 
uh, for me, it was just, just so liberating and just um, so great to find that community online in India itself to be like, wow, there are others like me and these are the lives that they're living and we're all living different lives, but we're kind of being resilient in our own ways. And it's really great to like just learn from others. And, you know, one of the things that I'm also involved in is um, a peer support program for queer folks by queer folks um, in India as well. And that's another way. I think that's such a great use of the internet because we do that online. So we have these kind of completely free confidential sessions that we offer to queer folks in distress who can literally speak to a peer and be like, this is what is upsetting me. This is what is distressing me. Which, I mean, when you go to the more mainstream, uh, you know, mental health practitioners or kind of those spaces, there's always a tendency to pathologize. And there's a tendency to tell you that there's, um, you know, it's, it's not always the most affirming space. Very often, even if you have a queer affirmative, like counselor or therapist, they don't really get what you're talking about. There's a lot of context setting that you have to do. That's just a lot of emotional labor. And have a space where you can go to someone else who's also a queer person in India and be like, isn't this so annoying? Like, this is really troubling me. And for them to be like, I get it. Like, I know it is, right? This, it's it's um, quite, I think, underrated that just that moment of, of connection, of solidarity. And things like this are possible because of the internet. It means that you can connect to people um, across the country and hear stories. And I mean, offer that kind of support. And I think Nu also was talking a lot about, you know, community systems of care, um, interdependence, community solidarity. And I'm so like, I, I think I, I'm so invested in, in building those kinds of uh, communities of care. And I think this is one of those ways and, and the online just really facilitates this in such a great way. So I think it's, it, is, it's, it's, it is definitely very important. I think there's also, of course, there are questions that come up in terms of access. Not everyone has access to the internet. Not everyone is able to meaningfully access the internet even if they have quote unquote access that ticks a box, right? And I think that's where the idea of making sure that we have some kind of offline spaces that can complement the online also come in. Um, but at the same time, I think just the fact of knowing that these online spaces are out there sometimes, just the fact of knowing that that exists can be in and of itself uh, just a great form of, of solidarity building for those, even if they're not accessing it all the time, you know, even if, if they're not being part of it all the time. But yeah, I think it's it's just so important, and there, it it becomes all more important, like I said, in uh, contexts where you don't have those very visible queer communities in the physical space. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Tanvi. And that point you made about not everyone being able to access the internet, or not everyone being able to access the internet in the same way, super super important. Um, and yeah, I mean, it makes me think of the Zoom context where, you know there's a minority of users use internet i mean use instagram but perhaps whatsapp could be a space for you know group sharing etc because data is cheaper for whatsapp etc etc so yeah um thank you so much so yeah we've talked a lot we've got so many great insights like time has gone really quickly so i'm just going to sort of pose our last sort of general question um just to close on yeah what can we sort of look forward to uh, in your work? What are you coming up with next? Or what are you excited to share about? Yeah, uh, Tiffany, go ahead. Uh, firstly, I'm retiring out the game. It's been good, it's been good. Um, I actually am off to become a psychologist now. No, psychiatrist, psychologist, psychologist, my bad. I don't have the med degree. Um, yeah, no, I'm back in school doing psych. And yeah, it's, that's my next journey. You got to leave it to the youths, guys. I told you I'm getting old now. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess. I can't thirst trap forever. Um, but season two of my podcast is going to be coming out, which is really, really fun. Holla um, will just keep being holla online. So there's nothing I would say from me that I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is what's happening. Because I feel like I have given all my offerings. And I must now go be a queer elder, as Dan B said. <laughs> I must go be a queer elder now, guys. I must retire. But yeah, so it's a psych degree and then hopefully just contributing to the community in that way because there's a lot of healing that needs to be done there, both within the feminist realm, the queer realm, just women in general, you know, DNC folks. It's just, it's a lot. There's a lot going on. So that is my next step. <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. And I think it's, I don't know, but it seems like such a 
beautiful progression actually just like looking at what you have created with Hola Africa you know collaboratively but um and where you're going now I think it sounds beautiful and yeah <laughs> wishing you the best for sure and uh what about yourself Nu you're in the second year of revival um disability magazine and you're studying what do we yeah what are you excited about <laughs> yeah uh same as Tiffany actually so um in my master's I'm doing women's studies currently but I do want to um pursue another master's in psychology because um I did a psychology undergrad and I want to um ultimately hopefully become a disability affirmative therapist because I feel like that's really lacking um in a country like India um uh, right like oh uh, like Tanvi said like having a therapist who just gets it like uh, uh having a uh, having a disabled therapist with lived experiences who who gets your identity right uh, uh when when I first went to therapy I didn't have that for so many years um and then I met with a trauma informed um disability affirmative therapist uh, many people don't understand that to have a disability is to is to have trauma there's a lot of disability grief in it um so that's my that's i'm on my journey with that um and i just contributed like to an anthology um uh it's yeah it's actually here <laughs> uh it's called a big mistake and i wrote a story called the crib gang which again um Ex, um explores poor disabled women um in a new city right it's drawn a lot from my um real life experiences of me when i was in delhi when i was studying um so the crib gang is like creating a, a new um like not a new like recreating reclaiming a disabled culture right uh, a culture of disability, a, a, a culture of disability where uh, it's not viewed as a curse or ugly. And um, again, reiterating what both Tanvi and Tiffany said is creating a, a disabled and queer ancestry, right? Having generations of um, disabled and queer folks organizing and as for revival, um, I'm uh, we have weekly meetings right now. I'm just taking it one day at a time. I'm looking forward to this weekly meeting that will be on disabled anger, that you know, uh, creating a space of uh, to express the anger, you know, uh, during the pandemic, like people are roaming around without any masks, not caring about um chronically ill lives so how do we feel how do we look at ourselves in a situation like that and um yeah so i guess i'm also uh, in the process of writing like a book um uh, again following the same theme a lot of my themes are related to taking up space in public spaces um with my identity so in new cities um having a uh, new friends having uh new lovers uh like uh exploring basically exploring myself exploring self-love and and all that comes along with it so yeah yeah oh that's fantastic also sounds so exciting and so beautiful in just terms of like, um, as you said, self-discovery and, you know, really expressing yourself um, and your truth. It's really awesome. I mean, both of you are just doing so much. When we're talking about your offline, online work, I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm not using the hours in my day well enough. <laughs> really, really cool. Um, Tanvi, you've also got a lot going on upcoming, so yeah. 
<laughs> no, it's 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 great to hear what Tiffany and you have in store. Um, I for me actually, what's coming up is I'm actually starting a PhD later this month on the topic of decolonial uh, articulations of Indian queer sexualities. Very close to what we were talking about today, and that that's why I was very excited. I think also to be sharing space with Tiffany and Nu and just hearing their uh, insights as people who run these kinds of spaces. Um, yeah, and I think there's there's so much to unpack there, especially when we look at kind of uh, decolonial or post-colonial approaches to Indian queer sexuality. Of course, there's like um, a lot of the colonial legacies, but I'm also interested in kind of unpacking how things like caste and class also play into it, into ideas of um, queerness, queer desirability, and also like homonormativity, I suppose, where we kind of um, I, the, constructing the idea of the respectable queer, right, which is a myth. Uh, so, um, I mean, it should be a myth, essentially. So I, I think that's what's in store for me. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited to get that started and keep following the work that Holla Africa and Revival Disability Magazine are doing as part of this. Yeah. Amazing. It's going to be so exciting, Tanvi. I can't wait to like, I mean, we'll always be in touch, like what you're working on and stuff. But um, thank you all so much for joining this session I think you know it's so important to just have these dialogues but also be doing something about it everybody's you know doing things um yeah I feel really inspired at the same time as like learning a lot and I don't know it's just a really really nice space so thank you so much